the climate change movement has caused a lot of uh, holding back on, on the availability of funding. I would say that's been a problem. So all of these factors have now created a situation where yeah, we are now having a, a real shortage of oil. Hello, I'm Noel Lim on ASEAN Speaks by Maybank Investment Banking Group. The bank has a strong buy call on Hibiscus Petroleum on the back of improved earnings and expectations of oil prices remaining at elevated levels. Hibiscus is the first spec or special purpose acquisition company to be listed in Malaysia and has gone through ups and downs. I speak to Dr. Kenneth Pereira, CEO of Hibiscus Petroleum, to understand the prospects and to get insights into the oil and gas market. Ken, welcome to the podcast. What's your vision for the next five years for Hibiscus as investors are becoming more ESG-oriented and banks are becoming more discerning about lending? Our vision has not changed for the, for the last um, 10 years. We started off being, a, we wanted to be a respected and valuable um, energy company. But in the last few years, I think we've also added the word responsible in our vision statement. So now it's, it reads that you know, we want to be respected, valuable and responsible. In terms of respected, of course, you know, it's about operating safety, complying with uh, statutory obligations in countries, uh, participating in some CSR activities, um, supporting local industry. That, that's what I'd say when we say we want to be respected. And um, then we're also um, trying to, for the word valuable, I suppose we are looking at delivering value to shareholders because of the blend of our values. And, the, and, and we hope that some of our values resonate with our investors. We try to be as transparent as possible, deliver on promises and obviously deliver them some kind of level of return that they expect. But uh, going to your question about the ESG element, so we added the word responsible into our vision statement a couple of years ago. You know, we've always felt uh, in terms of the, the ESG, you know, acronym for social and, and, uh, and governance, we've, we've always tried to be, you know, try to be as best as we can, do as much as we can on the social side as well, the community, especially the last two years. But on the environmental side, uh, recently, we have, we have started putting a lot of environmental considerations into the business decisions we make. We come up with a very, I would say, quite a big sustainability report. We measure, we do a lot of the measurements required, uh, these measurements uh, in terms of GHD emissions to help us improve. And uh, we have shown substantial progress in that area. So we are, we are looking uh, in terms of the uh, mission, it means that we are trying to improve our current production rates. When you talk about our mission for hibiscus and vision, we're trying to improve from our 23,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day. We're trying to increase 35 to 50,000 barrels a day over the next five years. We've not gone very aggressive on this number because of the banks. So going back to your question, we don't think lending, we're going to be able to borrow easily buy assets. And when you have an asset, you need to grow the asset. You need to try and improve improve its performance. You will need money for that. So yeah. banks are becoming a little bit more discerning, but it's not only the banks. It's also the credit rating agencies. They are also uh, quite uh, quite strict. Uh, even even uh, investors for bonds, also very, very strict. Uh, and instead of just before having to look at uh, a credit committee and a risk committee in a bank, as part of their process to lend. Now you have ESG committees. Banks also have come up with ESG committees and they make you fill up, you know, you've got to get through their ESG framework. They've got a whole bunch of questions around their ESG framework. They talk about uh, participation of women in the business and the leadership, uh, what are you doing on your governance? And then of course your environmental, you know, your, env your environmental considerations. So it's quite a wide scope of stuff you have to look at nowadays to try to get money from these uh, bankers and, and get through rating agencies and all of it. So, so we, we look at unconventional sources of borrowing. For our industry, we are fortunate that we are dealing with um, a couple of large off-takers for our oil. So they are looking at um, you know, off-takers like BP in the North Sea and Trafigura in Singapore. So we, we are able to sometimes pre-sell the oil and get some kind of advance what, what we call prepayment facilities, and that helps our, our you know, gives us some working capital lines. 
So um, these are some of the largest companies in the world. You know, BP Oil Trading, Trafficker is probably one of the largest non-government owned uh, companies based out of Singapore. So these are some sources of our financing and they understand our business. They understand when we are doing things in the ESG space, what our limitations are. So hopefully uh, going forward, uh, we should be all right. I've read that you are keen to increase gas in your asset mix as coal is being replaced as a source of uh, energy. Where would you say Hibiscus is currently in this energy transition agenda? The Repsol assets that we acquired, one of the attractive features about the Repsol assets was the fact that it um, gave a, a bigger gas weighting to our portfolio. Prior to the Repsol acquisition, there was only about 3% gas in our production. Post the Repsol acquisition, 31% of our production will be gas. So that acquisition um, helped us to kind of bring us you know, into this, this space. Uh, we we're using it as an opportunity to learn a little bit more about gas production operations. Normally, running a gas asset is a little bit easier. We need to kind of learn about it. So this gives us an opportunity. Um, in terms of the energy transition, I think we have made good progress. Um, we have challenged ourselves. We challenged ourselves a couple of years ago to see if we could get into the Malaysian Bursa FTSE for Good Index. So we said, okay, um, we will try and see what we need to do to kind of build a little track record on that index. So we put in our submissions and, and we got it on the first try uh, and we were successful. I think there are out of the 900 listed companies in Malaysia, there are about just under 80 companies that are on the index. And we are a top quartile member of the index. So we're in the top 25% in terms of rating. So we were very, very happy with that. I think the, you know, the, if I recall the other three, other two members uh, in the oil and gas space in that index are Yinsen and Dialog. So we felt we were in reasonably good company, uh, companies with great, you know, with great track records and, and trying to do the right things in the ESG space. So we were happy to be in the, in the index as one of few oil and gas companies. You know, generally companies that are that do well in these type of index um, that indices, there's a kind of idea that the larger you are, the better you do in these indices. But so we were particularly happy that we're not a very large company and, and we were able to do quite well. Then we said, make sure our measurements, make sure we are confident about the measurements we are making because you can't improve unless you measure properly. So we, uh, on the assets that we have now, we, we, we get a lot of uh, measurements. You know, one of the things, an advantage, small advantage of buying assets from large companies that we bought our assets in the North Sea from Exxon and Shell, we bought in Malaysia from Shell, and now we have bought from Repsol. One thing about all of these international companies is they do measure, when, when they make a measurement, it's a reliable measurement. So we could start using these measurements, assessing how we were doing and whether we were improving. Uh, once we started measuring, then we say, okay, where are the low hanging fruits? What could we do? For North Sabah, um, we, we very quickly were able to see that we have 20 platforms if, uh, and 18 of them were unmanned. This is just an example of what we did. For the unmanned platforms, we said, if we cut using diesel on the generators that provide power and we could somehow pay of of erecting solar panels and mini wind turbines on these platforms and have battery storage there. We could potentially, uh, because they were unmanned platforms, so they went down, you know, life was not at risk, put it this way. It would be, uh, some production would be at risk, but not, uh, not life. We started swapping out um, the gensets. So, and it was incredible because actually it, it, it was absolute commercial sense. We didn't have to transport diesel offshore. We didn't burn diesel. We reduced emissions, and and good news, we abs we reduced our absolute GHG emissions number, absolute number by six percent, on a on a unit, you know, on a uh, GHG emissions intensity number. It was more impressive. It was like eighteen percent. So these things immediately, you know, when you, when you start seeing that actually a commercial advantage apart from the planetary, you know, the planet considerations type thing. So we, we started now looking for opportunities even in the North Sea. The North Sea now, we are subject to very, very expensive carbon taxes. And 10% of our OPEX per barrel in the North Sea, our OPEX per barrel is around $20. About $2 a barrel is we pay carbon taxes. Now this year, the challenge for the team working on this, and this in, in, involves both technical and commercial members of the team, 
I've given them a challenge of reducing the carbon taxes amount we pay by 25%. In other words, reduce our carbon taxes from $2 a barrel to $150 a barrel as a first step. The first idea is to look at the size of our, our turbine. Some of the assets that we have managed because of the type of company we are, we look at the fields in their in midlife, late life type fields. Okay? The equipment is old. So maybe there are more efficient engines, more efficient turbines, more efficient machinery you can, uh, you can uh, replace them with. If you replace some old equipment with new equipment, you get uh, efficiency type savings. So immediately you can do that. Another thing that you might do is because of the reliability has also improved, whereas before we may have three turbines, you'd have you know, uh, one turbine doing the work, second turbine is a backup, and third in case the backup was broken, you still have a backup. So nowadays, because of reliability, you might be able to say, well, instead of having three, I'd have two, but I make them bigger. But because I'm making them bigger and they're more efficient, maybe my overall emissions are lower. So you go into those type of discussions. So it will involve CAPEX, but in the long term, it will help us on OPEX and it will help us on uh, emissions numbers. In the recent budget, Singapore has raised carbon taxes. Uh, do you foresee other countries in this region following suit? Like uh, you have assets in Australia as well as uh, Malaysia? Yeah, so I believe that Malaysia is looking at, at imposing some kind of carbon taxes. They're going into voluntary carbon type uh, markets now anyway. But um, I think uh, we have to be we, we have to be a little bit pragmatic in emerging economy. Okay? We also, I believe, should think about the specific set of circumstances that the whole world has undergone the last experience, the last two, three years with COVID. And then you ask yourself, do you want to weigh down investment and industry with another layer of tax instead of, um, you know, practically speaking, you say, can the planet wait an extra two years before you impose all of these things? Just because the, the northern, I would call them the northern economies or the more advanced economies have got a, a very uh, aggressive timeline and they've got all these targets, you know, 1.5 degrees, 2050 and, and the carbon budgets and all these things they talk about. Very good. But in the emerging economies, we need to really understand, do we have other priorities, I believe, that, that could, that should take the precedence right now? And, and I hope that when the countries come up with these taxes, I mean, Singapore, well-developed economy, uh, people can afford it, good good health system, and, you know, all, everything kind of good infrastructure. It, yes, you can afford maybe a, a, a high carbon tax. Can the same be said of Malaysia or, or Vietnam or Laos? I would think right now there are maybe other priorities and what we should be doing is trying to encourage investment, not kind of taxes which are going to weigh down investment hurdle rate. What Singapore wants to do when they raise carbon taxes, the extra revenue or the revenue they earn will go into green projects. And those can go in the form of grants, incentives for companies to go greener. So it sort of stays within that space of green. It is supposed to, but what you're creating, creating a subsidized base to this type of, this type of opportunities. Just to say, on as a little aside, we have looked at over the last one year, I think north of 30 opportunities, maybe as much as 40 opportunities. And we've been trying to look for opportunities in the sustainable or energy transition space that actually could stand up as an independent business by itself without subsidy, because subsidies are all transient. They'll be there for a while and they won't be there. And it's not fair that they're there all the while. We look, we're looking at opportunities like this and we don't find them easy to come by. Um, you don't find opportunities that without subsidy in this area that, that, is e they are, you know, that are easy to come by. Many of these projects uh, that we've seen are single digit returns actually. So you ask yourself with the cost of funds that you know, we, we might be paying 6% or 5% or nowadays with these green, the green bonds and all that might be paying 4%. And then you're returning 8%. And, and what, what are you giving shareholders in terms of dividends? When do free cash flows come in? We're trying to kind of uh, juggle with these considerations, you know, and, and maybe for us also it requires a bit of a mindset change because we're coming from the oil and gas industry. If it doesn't pay back in four years, okay, it's a no-no. Okay, here you have projects that are going 
positive cash flow in, in nine to 10 years. And uh, I mean, it's it's crazy, actually. So when we look at these numbers, we just say, yeah, you know, it's not, it's just not working for us, kind of. But we have to all get real, I suppose. Balancing these considerations, and you have to be pragmatic because you don't want to end up overpaying for an asset just because it's sustainable and it has all these renewable uh, components to it. What do you foresee will be a practical mix, uh, say in five years' time? Uh, what would be your your energy mix? Would it be 50 gas, 50% gas, 50% oil, or maybe still below 50% for gas? For me, the more gas we have, the better okay, going forward it's going to become very competitive to buy gas assets. So if you are looking at your gas portfolio, it's going to have to come from taking some risk on exploration. In my world, uh, you know, in, my, in, in our world, we are going to have to look at fields around the infrastructure or opportunities around the infrastructure that we manage. And we've got to look and maybe for a change, prioritizing the oil opportunities, maybe prioritizing gas or some of the risk capital. And you are also looking at some renewable uh, opportunities like solar and geothermal. Is that uh, what you have in mind? No. Um, I, have, uh, I have certain views on, on solar. I'm not sure whether solar without storage is really a viable solution. I think solar is a viable solution for domestic. I believe that all of us should have solar. In fact, we should even legislate probably solar on, on our roofs should be a mandatory thing. And your electricity supply should be supported with solar at the domestic level. For industrial use, I believe that solar does not really achieve without proper battery, without proper storage solutions. It does not achieve what uh, you, know, you would desire because all the while you would need to have gas turbine or a coal-fired turbine on spinning reserve somewhere because if a, if a dark cloud blocks sunlight for half an hour over, over a solar farm and that caused a little kind of drop in your electricity supply and you're a, fact, you're, you're a factory trying to keep temperature at a certain level to make sure the food you're processing is, is delivered right. You want to be sure that uh, you know, you're going to have a power supply. So all the while when you are having solar, you're having to have a backup on reserve. So I don't think it really supports... Uh, you know, a proper plan. So I'm uh, sad to say I'm a believer in, in carbon capture and I'm a, I'm, in a, I'm a believer in nuclear power uh, for long-term industrial use. If you really want to talk about clean, you go gas with carbon capture or you go nuclear power. And uh, then you ask yourself, well, uh, nuclear, nuclear power, it's kind of long gestation period. Where, where is it going to be implemented first? It's too long-term and, and we would not have access to it. Okay, so I think uh, we would just be focusing on gas and looking at carbon, carbon capture related to gas. There, there is this concept called power density. Uh, you may have heard of this concept. It is the amount of power you can store or, or create in a certain space. Oil and gas is um, and nuclear. Nuclear is actually the top. It uses the least amount of footprint and it creates a hell of a lot of energy. So nuclear is right at the top for power density. Oil and gas is number two in this list. A small amount of space, a lot of a lot of energy can be can be produced. So then you look at uh, where solar and batteries are, and they are way down the line. So you need a lot of space. So then you go into issues of biodiversity and all of these type of things. You're trying, you know, you're, you're trying to you're trying to kind of come to a balance on that. It might be so that you might be able to set up a, a solar farm in a desert. But then a desert is very far away from, from where the energy might be used. So you get into all of these type of issues. For me, I'm looking at, at practical aspects like gas, carbon capture, good power density. In other words, the footprint is freckled. Solutions are being developed there. Oil and gas companies have a certain amount of know-how in this space. So we are trying to see how we can participate in a meaningful way in this area. About your acquisition of Repsol, our analyst TJ views the valuation as undemanding. So it sounds like you got a good deal there. Uh, how did that happen and what's the strategy for Repsol? When we finished uh, acquiring the Shell assets, the North Sabah Shell assets in 2018, as part of our kind of growth plans, we looked around at uh, other assets in the area and we tried to come up with a short list of assets that we could uh, potentially keep a very close eye on. Repsol assets featured uh, very high on that list. One, because it was 
of a scale. Uh, it also had gas. Our strategy was moving towards having a little bit more gas waiting in the portfolio. We had only previously in Malaysia a footprint in East Malaysia. This gave us a footprint in West Malaysia as well. And it also allowed us to tiptoe into a new country like Vietnam. This asset we identified in 2018 being an asset of interest. And we did have informal chats with Repsol as early as that to say, you know, we have, we, please, you know, if you're thinking about selling this asset, please keep us in mind. But at that time, they were very clear. They said they were, that there were no plans to sell it. In 2019, we reconnected with them. We said, look, we're, we're interested. They, they had not made any decisions on their side. In 2020, they indicated uh, to us and to the market in general that they were going to call a tender, an international tender to sell these assets. We participated in the tender. It was a, a, a two-stage tender, meaning that there's a phase one where you kind of you put in an indicative uh, in a small shortlist and you move on to stage two. We had that opportunity uh, because of the work we had done previously on the asset. We had, you know, we had been looking at asset for a while. We had a couple of people in our company who had also previously worked for Repsol and prior to that, Green Talisman, who owned the assets before, before Repsol. So we had a lot of in, in-house knowledge about the assets. So we were able to we kind of put in a, a bid that we were comfortable with. And uh, fortunately, all the work we had started in 2018 finally paid off, actually. So that's the story. So then what's the plan? The plan is uh, very simple. I think first step, I would say, is integrate the asset. Uh, we, we have a phrase in the company. We say, keep the bike upright. In other words, don't disturb it too much. It's a nice going concern. This is the reason why we bought it. Uh, make the people feel important that they're doing a good job. They're contributing uh, and, and really engage with them. So I think that's the first step. Keep the bike upright. Make sure the production operations are not disturbed by our intervention. Next step, empower the people a little bit because they've always been working for large companies. Uh, we've had this experience before. When you buy an asset um, and, and you, the people come along, they are mostly used to uh, taking instructions from from you know from a, a foreign HQ or something like that. So what we want we do is always we empower them with certain limits of authority, allow them to make decisions, make them feel a, a greater ownership of the asset. After all, they are the experts in the asset; they've known it for so many years. And many times you'll find a lot of good ideas with those people who have joined you, and and they've never had the opportunity to vent some of the ideas, you know, and share some of their ideas because of the nature of the organization they worked with. And just kind of share with them a little bit of our entrepreneurs. We're listening, we're, you know, we'd like to listen to anything you might have to say about this asset or any other ideas you have because you're part of the team now and, and we acquired the company because the team, are they're a good team. So we'd like to hear your ideas, what do you have to share with us? And, and so those are our plans for the next one year. What about bonus and profit share your staff would think about? In terms of this reward performance type uh, discussion, I think what we can say is that we reward performance very, very well. This is the, the issue we had when we started. When we started as a small company, people you know who joined us saw it as a risk. People were joining us from Shell and, and the larger companies. So we had to pay a little bit higher than market rates to attract them. So we've always set our standard a little bit higher, but we also want to attract very good people. And I'm very, very proud. You know, The team I'm working with now in the company and Hibiscus, and it, it's the best team I've worked with. No, honestly, fantastic team, motivated team of the highest level for everybody. Everyone has so much respect for the other, only because they are all coming with so many different experiences and a lot of a lot of knowledge and experience in the company. And they come from different backgrounds, so everyone recognizes that the other has something to say. And so we have a very, when I say transparent, I mean, we share all our kind of issues at, and, and we find solutions from each other, actually try to have a very flat organization we try, and and youngest person in the company has access to me okay i try to make myself accessible and it's like that for everyone whenever i'm asked by the board you know uh, how, succession planning and all of this i say now leadership team there are at least four or five ceos uh, people who have held ceo positions before people who have actually uh, and and they still join us to kind of contribute something Many people like the idea of what we are doing. We're just trying to demonstrate that a few people can set up an oil company and actually compete in a very global space. Important bring young people into the company also who are talented and who, I mean, they come from good schools. They work hard. They come out of university. They're all excited about life ahead. And what we try to do is make sure that they're not disappointed. 
What's the plan for the two sea resources, Marigold UK and Australia operations now in this rising energy price environment? Different approaches for both of them. Marigold, right? Marigold was a very special asset that we bought in the UK. It was bought in, in conditions that were the, the seller was slightly in distress and we were able to react to the particular set of circumstances that impacted them. And we were able to buy those assets. And I think if I recall rightly, we bought those assets at around $1.80 per barrel. It's a field of about 43 million barrels discovered oil. And um, what we're doing now is we're taking it through uh, certain approval processes in the UK. Uh, we were very excited two weeks ago when you know, the Chancellor of the Exchequer actually uh, mentioned that it is one of six projects that the UK government will be fast tracking this year for approvals. So that really excited us because, uh, you know, we've been working through the approval process very, very, uh, I would say, diligently. We have 87.5% in that asset right now in terms of ownership level. And we would not do this project with more than 50% uh, stake. You know, I think up to about 50% stake in the asset would be good for us. Uh, so the additional 37.5% uh, would be something that we would sell down uh, to help us fund the development cost of the project. Now, when we sell down is, is going to be quite critical. Uh, if we wait until all the approvals are obtained from the government, say, and if the government fulfills its promise by the end of this year, we would probably on the, you know, we, we paid about 180 or something like that per barrel, we'd probably get more than double that. If we sell it anytime now, we might get somewhere in the range of 2 to $3 a barrel. If the right partner, potential partner comes along and we think this would be a really good value creative partner to us, it would be a good good party to work with, et cetera, then we may sell a bit early. Australia is slightly different. Australia, OPEX per barrel is a little bit high. It's running at about, we estimate it to be about 30 to $40 a barrel. Yeah, OPEX per barrel will be the driver actually on, on, on the, the timing of a decision to, to invest for the Australian to see resources. We have 8 million barrels in Australia. OPEX per barrel in Australia, we estimate at about $30 to $40, as opposed to the Malaysia where it's about $20 a barrel. So when we're investing money in Australia, you know, you ask yourself, if I invest in Malaysia, I get, uh, there's more headroom, there's a bigger margin. So when you do it in Australia, you want to be a bit more careful. How long this oil price remains at what it is. And if it starts showing a trend that, you know, for the next six months, it's sitting at, at $85, $90, we get good headroom. Uh, we have the plans to develop Australia on hand. It could be something that we activate quite quickly. For Marigold uh, UK, why can't you pre-sell the oil in order to raise funds instead of having to sell down your stakes? Yeah, I think you can pre-sell the oil. It's just that from a risk perspective, for projects of this size, you may want to share the risk with somebody else. Uh, it's quite a large project. What's your view of oil prices in the next three years and what are some risks to your assumption? Our view on oil prices... Um, Actually, uh, we think oil prices will remain strong for a few reasons. One, of course, um, it's driven by all the underinvestment. Last five years from 2015, 16, the investment throughout the entire uh, half of the decade, actually, six, seven years, no investment uh, and barely any money spent on maintenance. Anything discretionary was held back. Because of the uncertainties caused by climate change movement, I would say, lack of lending by banks. Banks, when they saw the oil prices fall, uh, were a little bit less, uh, less active in lending. So when they do that, everything then becomes equity funded. The climate change movement has caused a lot of uh, holding back on, on the availability of funding. I would say that's been a problem. So all of these factors have now created a situation where yeah, we are now having a, a real shortage of oil. In the most conservative projections, you can see that oil and gas is still required until 2050. There is a, a requirement going ahead. There's not so much for investment. If you look at the projections, um, I, I'm quoting Reistad here. Reistad is saying that $1.2 trillion 
has got to be put into exploration to meet oil and gas demand until 2050. In other words, what they're saying is what has already been discovered is not enough and no one is doing this. So if who is going to put money into exploration now, if you're not even sure whether, whether you know, uh, the banks are going to fund the developments, I don't really think it's a very healthy situation for anybody. It's, there's a lot of uncertainty. So, but my view on oil prices is they will remain strong. It's almost not a risk, it's almost a certainty. Iran will come back into production. And I think what's going to happen is when Iran comes back into production, there will be a dip in oil prices because it will, it will be media kind of hyped up to kind of drive oil prices down a little bit. But after a few months, I think people will find, or maybe six months, people will find that actually Iran is in the same boat as everybody else. Well, all of these countries have access, free access to money and free access to kind of, you know, markets, etc. They have not been able to invest. In the, so what makes you think Iran that has been subject to all these sanctions is just going to come back into the market and overnight just start producing oil? Why weren't they affected by all the, all the uncertainties that affected everybody else? And, and everyone else is underperforming. Every, every month, uh, OPEC releases quota to all the OPEC members and all of and, and compliance to the quotas is 116%, meaning to say that people are under de delivering. If the price is so high, they can't meet their quotas already given. And in all of these countries with free access to capital, free access to spare parts, inventory, maintenance, people, human resource, etc., cannot meet it. What makes you think Iran can overnight come in and that's just my view, personal view. What impact does the Russian-Ukraine conflict have on hibiscus decisions uh, this year? Oh, I mean, obviously, uh, it's indirectly, it's caused gas prices to go up in, in Europe. Um, and all of a sudden, the small amount of gas that we produce in Anasuria has become a very valuable resource. You know, we are earning four or five times the amount for that gas that we produced in Australia than a year ago. We are no participant in all these geopolitical matters, but we are a beneficiary in, in the sense that it's gas uh, has become a valuable resource in Europe. Hibiscus is the first spec in Malaysia and one in two that are still standing. Um, now, specs are hot again, at least in the US. What is key to the company's longevity and relevance? We started the spec, oil was at $100. Okay? It was impossible for us. We raised 240 million ringgit. 240 million ringgit was not, not buy a producing asset. You could not, it was just too little money. So we had to put money into exploration, probably of oil in Oman and all of that. In 2014, there was a downturn in oil prices because of the American shale phenomena. I remember there was all this fracking going on onshore US and uh, and oil production just skyrocketed out of the US. They were exporting a lot of oil, but brought down and, and caused oil prices to plummet. So then uh, what we had to do is, uh, and, and that was a very important decision. In 2015, we decided to write off all our exploration assets. We said, look, uh, we can buy producing assets with, without the attendant risk, actually. So we could do that. A short period of a few months started prospect acquisition, acquiring a, a producing asset. And then we bought the North, uh, the Anasuria cluster in the North Sea. We bought that. Once we bought the Anasuria cluster from the North Sea, it was very important for two reasons. One, we bought the asset from ExxonMobil and Shell. That gave us a track record of doing large companies. We, we didn't realize it at the time, but that was a, an endorsement. A large company is willing to deal with you. The North Sea is a very, very harsh marine environment. It's a tough place to work. It's a mature regulatory kind of environment. With that track record, we were able to come back to Malaysia, acquire a field in Malaysia. Again, in an international tender from Shell, we managed to acquire the North Sabah again as an operator. And after that, we were able to buy the Repsol assets again as an operator of the fields. Becoming an operator of the fields Petronas had to, had to approve us as being, you know, having the necessary knowledge and experience to operate large offshore fields. The Vietnamese government for the Repsol transaction also had to, had to do that. So now we've got approvals in the UK, 
We've got Zia, we've got approval in Vietnam, Australia, very, very, very important factor in hibiscus, uh, longevity. But I'd say all of it comes down to the team we have in-house now. Why do companies like Shell want to sell their assets, especially when we know that the prospects of oil and gas is still very strong? I think the large companies, they have a certain strengths uh, operating large fields. And, and, and when these fields come to the end of life, uh, you know, the last 10 years of the field or last 15 years of the field, oil fields last maybe 30 years, 40 years. The big investments, the technical stuff that they have to do on these oil fields, uh, maybe the large companies have all the resources. But once it goes into a kind of a steady state operation where you're looking at being cost optimal, I would say, uh, where you, you can't carry big overheads. Well, you don't want to have a, a global portfolio where the guy who's trying to do a small project in Malaysia is competing for the same capital that the guy who's doing a large project in Canada is. So you're trying to disperse, uh, distribute this capital. And then you're, you're having to look at, you rank all these projects and there's a small project of oil field in Malaysia uh, you know, very small amount of money required. And he's asking for some money. And there's another guy with a much better project in Canada, much better returns. He's asking for the same money. So these big companies have a big portfolio. They have to decide how to distribute capital. And after a while, they understand that actually they can't distribute capital to all the projects. And therefore, they sell some projects to other companies that may find these to be material. So what is small for a big guy becomes big for a small guy like us. <laughs> okay, so that's what it is. Mm. Okay. Thank you for making time for us and all the best. Dr. Kenneth Pereira, the CEO of Hibiscus Petroleum. I'm Noel Lim on ASEAN Speaks by May Bank Investment Banking Group.